Hi, I'm Sandy Lush and I love making Welsh quilts. I suppose this story of the flannel quilt starts with this 1900 Midroom quilt in Jen's collection. In 2011, I started creating exclusive patterns for Jen based on quilts in her collection. And I took the centre of the Midroom quilt and converted it into a cushion pattern. At the same time, I elongated the leaf, went back into the quilt to find another motif, and played around with these three things and came up with a whole pile of cock quilts, none of which I liked. So I actually abandoned the whole thing at that point and went on to making paisley quilts based on a motif in another of Jen's quilts. And this is part of the 2022 exhibition where the last 25 of the 43 paisley quilts I've now made were here on exhibition. And the gold quilt in the background, we did a video of how I made that and we showed it in the cinema. And that was such a success that Jen thought it would be fun to do something similar this year. And somehow I managed to agree to make a flannel quilt. I'd given Jen all my spare bits of flannel from the Paisley quilts, and in January they all came back to me with some spare flannel that Jen had as well. Having laid it all out on the carpet, I obviously had enough to make a cock quilt, so as I didn't want to make another Paisley quilt, I decided to go back and revisit some of my earlier designs. Having played around with the design in 2013, the Midrim design seemed the obvious place to start. Here is the original cushion pattern and the two motifs I created at the same time. I decided to play with creating a circle from the corner, so basically rotating around the centre from the corner rather than having the fans pointing inwards. This was a bit wonky, so it needed fixing, but I was pleased with the result. Now the spirals were a little bit too big. I could have made the containing box bigger, but having decided not to use the big spiral anywhere else in the quilt, I decided to remove it and replace it with the smaller spiral from the centre. I also removed it off of the corner fan, as I was going to use that as well. Now I've got a central design, but the centre looks a little bit weak as it doesn't have much of a central focus. So I decided I would remove those centre small spirals and I replaced them with the original Midrim motif from the border. So now I've got all the design elements that I use to make this quilt. To make it easier to follow the construction of this pattern, we have coloured in the various aspects so that you can see exactly which bits of these patterns have been used and where they've been used. And the centre motif also got rotated for use in a different orientation. So here is my centre, which I have enclosed in a box. Now the centre is square and a cock quilt is rectangular in shape. And so I need to elongate this design. And I have done this by adding the small motif from the quilt, rotated 45 degrees, above and below the centre box to elongate the design into a rectangle. I then used the petals from the centre circle to enclose the whole design, which was again defined by outlining trams. I had a good idea how large I wanted the quilt to be, so it was at this point that I added the corner fans, which were also enclosed in their outer tram lines. And then I put the leaves in. Now the leaf was a little bit big, so it actually got chopped off top and bottom. I could have made it smaller, but I didn't. Then I filled in the centre with square diamonds, I did extra lines on my inner border and put echo background quilting around the leaves. So here is my final design. Having carefully measured up all my fabric, I came up with a couple of piecing options. This is option one and what I've done is overlaid the quilting design onto my patchwork design and the two don't line up. And this is very, very characteristic of Welsh quilts, so I was very happy with this. The second option was this one, and on this one, the patterns do line up. So here are my two options, 
and as I like a challenge because I'm totally insane, I decided to use both. And I've made the front of the quilt the Welsh version where the patterns don't line up with the patchwork and the back the version where the patchwork and the quilting patterns line up with each other perfectly. So having done that, I had my cutting plan, which I had carefully worked out with seam allowances. And I marked up all my pieces on the flannel with a chalk pencil before I very carefully rotary cut it all out. Once I'd cut it all out, I pieced it all on my sewing machine and I used a three eighths of an inch seam allowance because the fabric is thick and it frays. And when I pieced it, I pressed my seams open again because of the large seam allowance and the thickness of the fabric. It would have been very difficult if I had pressed them all to one side as is usual when piecing patchwork. So here is my piece front and here is my piece back. Now I dealt with the back first. Welsh quilts traditionally have wool filling, so I have steamed some nice wool wadding and I've laid that out onto my design board. I then laid the back onto the wadding and very carefully tacked around the centre square and through the centre line in both directions so that when I flipped the quilt over, I could then see where the centres of the quilt are for positioning the front of the quilt in the right place. Having carefully folded the quilt in half, I could then line up the front piece along those tacking lines so that I know that the front of the quilt is centred exactly on the centre of the back and the wadding. So I've shown you how I've layered the quilt together, but I actually haven't got any markings on it for my quilting patterns. Now, I do flannel quilts in a different order to those that I normally use with ordinary fabric. So to show you how I mark up ordinary fabric, I'm going to use a cushion pattern that I'm developing. And here is my cushion pattern. And with a nice light coloured fabric, such as this lovely bit of green silk, when I lay the fabric on top of the pattern, I can see the design through and I can trace it on. And to trace it on, I will use an artist watercolour pencil. So if I'm using a beige thread, then I will use brown because that will blend with the beige colour of the thread. And if I use a peach colour, then I will probably use a pink watercolour pencil because that will blend better with the peach coloured thread. If I have a slightly darker fabric, such as this one, I can still see through it because the fabric is nice and thin. And with this one, I would definitely use the brown crayon to do the marking. However, I've decided that because I'm making a Welsh cushion, I want to use a nice Welsh red fabric. And so I've got some lovely oak shot, which happens to be just the right colour. And now I can't see my pattern through. So I need a light box. I'm going to bring the light box in. And because my pattern is bigger than the light box, I need to make sure that everything doesn't get dislodged. So I'm going to pin my fabric to the paper pattern to make sure nothing gets lost. Now, red, I'm not going to be able to see a red crayon on. So I can either use a silver pencil, the yellow watercolour pencil, and sometimes I will use a dressmaker's white pencil. But I've got a yellow one here and I'll just do a couple of lines. I'm going to do a straight line. So I'm going to use a ruler. If you haven't got a light box, pin the pattern and the fabric together and hold it up against a sunny window and you'll be able to see through. But I'm holding that up and you can see my star minus one line because it looks like I've missed one. But it's nice and visible. And I will actually go back down and put that line in. If you can't see where you've been, sometimes looking to the side will help you see exactly which line you've missed and I've missed that one. And now you can see that I've put that missing line in. 
So I can carry on marking that up, then I will layer it together, baste it together, and then I'll start quilting it. If I want to do the same with flannel, I have the problem. So here's another version of this pattern that I'm developing. And this time, instead of red cotton, I've now got red flannel. And even with the light box, you cannot see the pattern. So I might as well take the light box away because it's absolutely no use to me whatsoever. Iconic flannel Welsh quilts were made using old fashioned quilting frames, which stretched ooh, 90, 108 inches and you rolled the fabric on. And quite often, I think nearly always, the patterns were marked on by going around templates. So I've got a template here. And I've got a variety of markers. So the normal washout pen that people are so fond of, it lasts for about 30 seconds and then it just, the tip goes on it. It doesn't really like working against such a fuzzy background. I've got a white one, which I don't think works at all because it's got a very fine tip on it. No, nope, it doesn't show. I've got a soapstone marker, which is brilliant for dark fabrics. Doesn't really work on the panel. Silver pencil. Nope, that doesn't work either. A china graph pencil. North Country quilter Amy Ems was very fond of using a china graph pencil. And it is a thick, sticky line, and it doesn't really work that well off this flannel fabric. Now, when I marked up my cutting lines, I used this pencil, which was a uh, pastel pencil. And it works, but unfortunately, it rubs off very, very quickly. And this is a chalk pencil. And that has the same problem. It rubs off very quickly. And the best one that I found is an old fashioned bit of tailor's chalk, which does work, but quite cumbersome to go around templates. But that does show that again, it does rub off quite a lot. Now, if you're in a big frame, that's not a problem because it's open and you work on it and then you roll it once it's stitched. But if you're going to use a hoop like I do, then this is going to rub off far too quickly. So I tried all sorts of markers and I couldn't actually find anything that worked. So I came up with another idea and that was to use water soluble violin to get the pattern onto the fabric. So this is a piece of water soluble violin. As you can see, it's white which means that I can mark in any colour on it and I'll be able to see through. And it's got holes in it, which means I can see through so that I can be able to see my patchwork when I get that far. So now, take my piece of flannel away and bring in my pattern. And I can use either the blue washout pen Or I can use a water soluble artist pencil. And the general idea is that these marks will stay on for me to quilt. And then at the end, I'm going to get cold water onto this and it will all disappear. You do have to be careful because my iron had a little spitting fit just now. And hey presto, it is water soluble. I have holes in my water soluble violin, but fortunately, I can move it so that it won't affect where I am tracing. So when I'm making the flannel quilt, I am not marking up my fabric before I've layered it, which is completely different to how I do all the other quilts. So on my silk cotton quilts, I will mark my top fabric with my pattern and then layer the three layers together into the quilt sandwich. But this time around, I've layered my patchwork on my modding and now I'm going to bring it over to the table. So having layered it all up, I have been very, very careful that I have marked the centre 
here and at both sides so that I know where those centre tacking lines are on the back of the quilt. And I have marked up my water soluble lining to my paper pattern. So now I can take the paper pattern away. Again, more holes in my water soluble lining. And now I can remove my paper pattern. And now I can see my patchwork. I've got my pins placed in the centre of my seams so that I can see where they should go. And with a bit of patience and some fiddling around, I will be able to centre this so that everything is all lined up perfectly. And when it is, I will then pin these layers together and then I will base them together ready to be quilted. So I am going to be working through one layer of marked water soluble vinyl, my top patchwork flannel, my wool wadding and my back flannel. So I will be quilting through four layers, two of which are quite thick. So my stitches, as you will see soon, are not going to be small. Having got everything in position and pinned onto my design board so that it wouldn't move, I now based the quilt together and I've got a huge great big doll making needle to get through all the layers and some really nice soft Italian tacking thread. Basting stitches don't have to be pretty because you're going to take them away again at the end, but they do need to hold the layers together. And the rule of thumb is that about the width of your hand between the lines of basting stitches. This equates to about three to four inches apart in both directions. And here is the quilt completely basted. And I have actually put a little bit of extra violin around the edges to enclose the edges so that they don't fray. And just for good measure, this is my cushion piece also ready to sew. I've now got my tops marked and the three layers basted together for both my cushion and my flannel cot quilt. And as the three layers basted together are much thinner on the cushion, I'm going to demonstrate how to hand quilt on that because it is much easier. So I'm going to use some red orofilled thread, which is slightly darker than my red fabric, so it should show up my stitches nicely. And I'm going to use a size 10 bohin betweens needle. And the first job, of course, is to get the thread into the needle. I'm going to cut about 18 to 20 inches of thread. Snip it with some nice sharp scissors. And I'll move this out of the way. I'm going to show you. I'm going to make a knot. So I'm going to bring thread around in a circle so that the tail end of the thread is against the eye of the needle and I'm going to hold both of those in my thumb and first finger of my sewing hand and I'm going to wrap the thread one two three four times around the needle hold on to everything and pull the needle through and I have made what is basically a freestanding French knot and I'm going to bury that into the wadding to secure the thread before I start stitching. I always quilt everything, double bed size quilts, the lot in a 14 inch hoop. So that's the next thing. I need to put the hoop underneath. I'm going to start quilting in the middle so I've more or less centered it. Undo the screw and put, no, it's still too tight open the hoop out to put it on and what I want is a tension that has some give in it and it's as if the cat has sat in it and if I'm happy with that then I can tighten up the screw. Right, 
Right, so I've got my needle and thread. I've got my working hoop. All I need now is a couple of thimbles and I use a good ridged thimble on my sewing hand and I use a cheap domed thimble or even a flat thimble on my first finger underneath. So the first thing I'm going to do is bury my knot. So I'm going to go underneath into the wadding where I want to start stitching. So I'm about a centimetre away from where I want to start stitching. And then I can pull the thread through and pop the knot. And that tail is still sticking up. But if I put the needle in, just inside the fabric and flick the needle around, the tail would disappear. So here's my underneath thimble, which I'm wiggling backwards and forwards. It needs to be up there to receive the needle. And I'm gonna put the needle in on top of that thimble, transfer the grip, and now I've got the needle balanced between my two thimbles. Bring my thumb forward, it helps with the traditional rocking motion. So I'm gonna lever the needle back a little bit, push the thimble towards it, and then bring the needle up off the edge of the thimble. And I can pull that stitch through. I quite often sew this first stitch. I still use the underneath thimble and then I open up my hand and I can do another stitch. And what I'm gonna look at is the gaps in between and that gap is smaller than that gap. So I'll actually redo that one. Because I'm going in a circle, I probably can't do more than two stitches at a time because otherwise I'll lose the, the uh, flow of the circle and it will get little angular stitches in it. So I can carry on doing that. Now, of course, you can't see what I'm doing underneath. So what I'm going to do is bring in a piece of organza in a little embroidery hoop and I'm going to have to thread another needle with some red, red thread so that you can see what I'm doing. So here's my underneath thimble and my top thimble. I am not going to get even stitches doing this because this organza is very very slippery and when I quilt I don't hold the hoop but this is a small one and I will have to. So there is There is the needle onto that underneath thimble. And here is my balancing act. As I lever the needle back, I push that underneath thimble and then the needle has to come off the edge of the underneath thimble. Lever it up and repeat. And there I've got big stitches and tiny gaps because it's very, very difficult to do on this slippery fabric. But I hope you get the idea. If I turn my work round and then aim to go on this straight line that's coming up, on a straight line, I can get a lot more stitches on my needle. And that's because I'm not going round in a curve. So I can get one, two, three, and get four on. And I can judge them before I pull the needle through. So that is my cotton thread on my cotton fabric. But what happens when I want to quilt flannel? So here is my flannel quilt and I want to start in the centre and work my way out. And if I use my ordinary hoop, put the underneath on and open this right out, It doesn't want to fit and this is because the flannel is so thick and of course the quilts at Jenons were all made on old-fashioned quilting frames they didn't use quilting hoops but I definitely have a problem with this and I found that the only way to sort it is to actually tape two hoops together to hold the thickness of the fabric 
So now I'm going to push that down a little bit and hope that I can get my hoop over the whole lot. Just. It's still loose, so that's okay. So I'll tighten it up. And because the fabric is so thick, I'm going to need a thicker thread. And having examined a lot of old quilts, I have actually found that a thick brown thread seems to be the thing that used to be used the most. So this is some Robson Anton, and it is quite thick. I think it's a 25 weight. It might be a little bit thicker than that. And again, I'm going to thread my needle. Now, because this is so thick, my regular sewing needle, this little baby, will get lost in the layers of the flannel. And I have found that the best size needle is that, which is also a between, but now I'm looking at a size six between, because this one will go through all the layers. So now I've got to again thread it. And when I make the knot this time, I'm going to only wrap it round three times because the thread is thicker, it will make a bigger knot. So there's my knot. And that bit in the centre is very, very tight. So I'll start off by doing a spiral. And again, I'm going to put the needle... Oh, I need to do that straight bit first. OK. So I've got my needle into the layers, but not through to the back. I've put my finger underneath just to make sure that it's not gone through. And I'm going to pop the knot. And hopefully it will stay. And then I'm going to bring this round. And again, I've got my two thimbles. And I'm going to rock the needle just as before. But now I've got a big needle thicker thread and very thick quilt it is not going to be small well, that's even on my stand is a bit big and that is probably about the smallest gap i can get which isn't promising so i'll go back and have another go because this is going to determine the size of the stitches for the rest of the quilt so getting through all the layers is a bit of a culture shock after that nice thin cotton but here we go. And then I've got to go around this petal. Now these stitches aren't particularly even because I haven't practiced on this nice thick fabric. So I shall probably go out and do these again in a minute. But I have to bear in mind that the water soluble violin is very, very fragile. So I have to be careful if I do decide to unquilt it. So there's a little bit of that. And just so that you can compare the two, we'll need a real close up of this. These are my stitches on the flannel compared to my stitches on cotton. The quilt is now ready to sew and we are going to show you how I started in the middle and we took a, a photograph about every 25 stitches while the work was in the hoop because the water soluble violin is so fragile that I didn't want to rip any more of it than is humanly possible. And you can see that each hoop I'm gradually working my way around the quilt from the centre to the outside so that any lumps and bumps will be pushed towards the edges of the quilt. When I get to the edge, I have tacked an old towel onto the edge of the quilt, which extends the area over which I can work in, in my hoop. And I've just gradually worked around the whole quilt. Until I finished. I 
And here is the finished product, complete with bits of water-soluble violin that have rubbed off, or I have picked off, or have just gone by the by somewhere along the line. Having removed the tacking, the next step is to remove all the remaining violin. And I've just put the quilt over an error in the bath, and I'm hosing it down with a cold shower. And you can see it gradually coming off in pieces. Some of it just dissolves. So when the quilt was damp, I pinned it out on my design board and I got it as straight as I could manage to get it because it is very stretchy and I left it to dry. So it is now dry and ready to have the edge fixed. Now, I would quite often put a, a regular folded binding on a quilt, but because the fabric is so thick, I don't think that that would be particularly successful. And as this is a classic Welsh quilt, it seems right to do a knife edge finish on it because that is the traditional way of doing it. So I've got my quilt draped, paying particular attention to that line of stitching. And what I'm going to have to do now is trim the fabric on the front and the back and the wadding. So I'm going to keep the quilt pinned because I don't want to move it anywhere. But I'm going to move the pins in because I need to fold the edges back. So I'm just moving them out of the way. And the first thing I'm going to do is fold the top edge and anchor it in a few places. And I'm folding the edge right back to the stitching. So I'm actually pushing the edge to make sure that there isn't any excess fabric in there. I'll do that for now. And now I want to do exactly the same on the back. So I need to fold that under as well to the stitching. And then I'm going to pin everything together with regular pins because I'm going to trim these pieces back with my rotary cutter and ruler and I don't want the big glass headed pins uh, getting in the way of the ruler or accidentally knocking it and making my cutting wrong. So I'm now coming up to a corner and at the corner I have got another set to deal with. So again, keeping the pins in, I'm now going to pin this back. So this one will have to fold to the edge and then fold to the edge again to make sure that everything is back. And it will have to do exactly the same with the backing fabric. And then be really careful to make sure that I get a pin through the whole lot. And I will work my way along this edge next. And I will gradually work my way around the quilt until all the edges are folded back. And then I can start trimming. I'm being careful to keep the quilt anchored in place as I do so. Having pinned it all, all the way round, I have very carefully gone and checked that right at the edges, I can't see any of my backing fabric. So it's right butted up against the stitching. And the only bits that I can see a faint bit of red there, which will not be in the way. And the only real red I can see is where the fabric is still bleeding when I drip dried it, which means that I, when I finish this quilt, I will wash it yet again. So I'm going to remove the pins now, having checked all around the quilt, and now I'm going to move it off of the board and onto my cutting board so that I can trim the wadding. So I'm confident that nothing's sticking out that shouldn't be. And I'm now going to trim my wadding because I think it's safer to trim the wadding before you trim the fabric. And I'm going to line up my ruler on the edge, folded edge, leaving half an inch jutting out because I want my wadding 
half an inch away from where my last stitches were. Now this corner is very, very bulky. And as I'm only cutting in one direction, I'm going to, if I can find the pin, just for now, leave that back flat so that I can cut all of the wadding in one go. So there's my half inch. I'm not trusting where I folded this because it's actually beyond where I'm going to need anyway. So it doesn't matter if it's folded a bit further in, but I need to be very careful that this is half an inch. And because it's so thick, I'm actually sort of tilting the ruler slightly so that I can make purchase with the wadding. I'll move it towards me and unpin this corner as well, I think. Just so that it's now straight. And again, half inch away from the folded edge. And I'm moving, adjusting the ruler to follow the line of the fold because I need it to be parallel to the stitching. And for good measure, I am now going to just fold back this so that it lies flat and just concentrate on having this corner folded properly. Just to come back a little bit more. And then I can start on this side as well. And I will do this around the whole quilt. as well. So I will repeat that all around the quilt and then what I'll do next is I'll undo all the pins and fold the fabric back flat making sure that they're both lying flat. Again, I can go to there. So I've now got my wadding trimmed, but my fabric isn't. And because the navy is so dark, I'm actually going to mark it with a pastel chalk pencil so that I can see where those stitches are. And I want to make sure that my line of stitching is as straight as I can make it. And now I'm going to trim with my ruler an inch beyond my stitching line. So the wadding will be half an inch trimmed and the fabric will be trimmed by a whole inch. Being very careful to make sure I've lined up with the stitches. Again, chalk in here. Oops. 
and marking that line beyond the lines, I can check that the corner is square. So now I have fabric that is an inch back and front and the wadding which is half an inch which will allow me to fold the edges over the wadding and in on themselves to make the knife edge finish which I will show you how to do when I finish trimming the quilt. So now I have my wadding trimmed and my fabric trimmed and I'm going to start by folding the front edge over to the edge of the wadding and I'm going to pin it in place. I can pick up a pin. Be particularly careful at the seams so that it doesn't go out of control. That needs to be pinned back down because it's not the right size. This area here should be half an inch and the fold in the fabric should go right back down to where my quilting stitches were. And I'm going to just go round the corner as well so I can pin it as far as here and now I've got to make sure that it's flat over the back on one side and then again flat over the back on the other side again with my half inch and I'm going to stick a pin in there as well. Now you can see that the edge is wavy but I will fix that when I get there. Right so having sorted out. It's still a bit wavy there but I can fix that. I'm going to flip it over and now I'm going to do the same with the backing fabric so that I can fold it in on itself and then butt it up to my other edge and this time I'm going to pin vertically to hold it in position. I'm going to get a couple of inches done before I go back to the corner. And once that's there, I can take these. I can adjust this at a later date if I need to. What I need to do is keep that about half an inch. I can now go back to the corner. And now again, two folds and line it up with the front, making sure that the raw edges are tucked in. And again, just do a little bit around the corner. Once I had these pins in place, I can then go ahead and start sewing. Now I can either pin all the way around the quilt but as pins have a nasty habit of falling out, I'm actually going to do this a little bit at a time. So having got them sorted on the front and on the back, I'm now going to stitch along the edge. I can remove the horizontal pins, but keep the vertical ones in place. Now, because this is thick, I'm going to have to do my stitching from the front because with the quilting stitches, you can see they're much better defined on the front than they are on the back. And I want this edge of stitching to show, so I'm going to have to do it from the front. And I've done a few extra bits just so that you can see me stitching on the red because it's easier to see them on the navy. So I've got my quilting thread again. And I'm going to make myself a nice big one, two, four, five, six wraps, nice big knot because I don't want it coming through. I'm going to get my thimbles 
and sit down. And I'm going to start stitching on that last pin. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bury the knot inside the seam and hope it doesn't come through, which it shouldn't be such a big knot. And just to make sure, I'm going to make my first stitch a back stitch. And then to see how small the stitch is, even with a back stitch on the back. Now, I may use thimbles, but quite frankly, it's so thick, I'm going to be doing this one stitch at a time, so I probably won't bother. And I will make sure that the needle goes all the way through all of the layers. So it's joined on the back and on the front, knotted up together, hopefully never to come apart. And because it is so thick, I can actually get away with doing the occasional back stitch to anchor it. If I think I need it, which I will probably do when I come to this seam. I'm checking my folds as I go. And I'm trying to keep the stitches regular, but it's proving difficult. I'm going to get a back stitch in there. Oh, needles come on threaded, but you'll get the idea. So I've now done a few stitches and I actually have decided that the back stitch looks neater both back and front than the regular running stitch. So I will probably, when I get round there, I will undo that little bit and redo it with a back stitch. I think a back stitch on this thick fabric is more secure anyway. Now this corner, the navy needs to come out just a little bit. And it needs to go in there just a little bit. That tail's persistently picking it out, but I've managed to get it back in now. And as I forewarned, the th corner is really thick. And I th think the navy needs to come in a little bit there and out a bit there, just to try and straighten it up a little bit. And now I'm going to have to stab stitch it because it's just too thick to go through all the layers and keep it all under control. I'm going to make sure that the navy corner and the red corner meet with a stitch. And now I can turn the work round and attack it from the other side. And again, I'm going to adjust the navy a little bit. I think the red could possibly go in a little bit too. But I'm going to over sew that corner to make sure it all stays together. And now I can adjust the folds again and stab stitch through all the really thick stuff and then go back to my back stitch to secure the edge. And I'm just going to gradually work my way around the quilt until all the edges are butted up together and secured with stitching. So that is one corner. So completing the quilt, I need to check on the front, because I was working with water soluble violene, you can't actually see that the knot has buried properly. And I have found one here that didn't bury, and one here that buried and came back out again. And so I'm going to fix both of these with a nice big eyed darning or tapestry needle. So I'm going to put the needle in and bury it into the wadding. And now I'm going to get the tail end of the thread and thread the needle with it. And I can even put the knot through the eye of the needle. And then when I pull the needle, it's actually buried the knot for me. And I'm going to do the same with this side, except this time I need to go back in where I came out 
or completely pull the stitch out. And I think it's just easier to try and get the needle back down where the thread has come out. And if it doesn't work, I can pull it through and start again. And this time I'm going to just poke the thread and poke it through the needle. Oh, it's come out again. And this is useful if it's a really short piece of thread, which unfortunately this isn't. <laughs> oh, it's got a dodgy end to it. I will do it. There we go. It's going to poke the thread through the needle and then pull. And then that has got rid of that. So having done that, the final thing to do will be to wash the quilt again because there are bits of water-soluble violin still left in various places as, and the red was bleeding anyway. So we'll finish that off with a nice wash and then pin it out, block it out into shape. So here is the finished quilt's front and its back. And here is the original Mydrum quilt. I'm pleased to say that although all the motives were taken from this quilt, my flannel cock quilt is completely different. The quilt is being raffled and tickets are available in the shop. And the cushion pattern is also on sale in the shop. And the proceeds of both are going to support the quilt conservation that Jen is so passionate about. So I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you go and buy a raffle ticket. Thank you.